Hello. Welcome once again to Off the Shelf Books on Tour. New author visiting us today. The book is The Lie. This My guest is William Dameron. That's oh, right. Oh, thank you, God. <laughs> and the book is quite unique. Uh, why did you write it? Why did I write the book? Yeah. Uh, there's a quote from Toni Morrison that says, if there's a book that you haven't read and you can't find it, then you must write it. And this was a story in a book that I couldn't find in the world. And so I felt like it was really um, up to me to write it because I needed to tell this story because I wanted to help other people who had been through this to know they weren't alone. And um, I wanted to show the world that there was something really fantastic that can happen once you become true to yourself and become authentic. Cathartic. Yes, very mm -hmm. much so. You didn't find David Brednoy's book? Um, I did not. <laughs> uh, you should read it. He was one of the very first, and I had the privilege of interviewing him in his home. That's fantastic. Um, very comfortable, joyous, that the world knew. Uh, I don't believe he tried to hide it or live a, another life and stay true to himself. But I got to let you know, some of those pages made the hair stick up on the back of my neck. <laughs> you didn't scare me twice as much, but then again, that had to be 30 years prior to you writing your book. Right. And it, it is important to know that somebody else did this. Somebody else was brave enough to say, hey, listen to me, you might learn something. Mm -hmm. Was it worth it? Did you find it that cathartic? Yes, I think it was worth it, and here's, it, here's one reason why. Um, after I wrote the book, I gave it to my daughters to read, and my older daughter was 16 when we went through the divorce, and that was really a tough time. It was a tough time for any child, 16. Um, and I gave it to her, and she took it to work every day with her, and she would read part of it, and she would text me, and one of her text messages was, wait a minute, you didn't tell me you replaced my stuffed animal. You know, little <laughs> secrets that we had kept from her. Um, but then by the end of the book, she said, I feel like there were questions I didn't even know how to ask that were answered. And so she then said, um, I feel like I've been angry at you all this time, and I shouldn't have been. And so I think even before the book was published, it was already successful. But after the book was published, I've received, I receive emails every day from people who are going through the same thing, who are in um, a straight marriage, and they're gay, and they're hiding it, and they're still trying to figure out how to get out of that. So, so I've heard from people who understand that they're no longer alone. And how old are the girls now? The girls now are 28 and 26. Wow. Yeah, so they're a bit older now. And it comfortably works well? It works very well. Oh, yes. good. Yeah. Oh, good. We're at a good point. Um, I am married to a man, Paul, who has three children from a previous marriage uh -huh. as well. And so there's five of five <laughs> kids. You call that us. a mixed, blended, chop suey family. Exactly. <laughs> but thank you, God, that it works. Yeah. You couldn't have done it 30 years ago. Right. Without many bruises and bumps and pain. Now, pain is big time. Does the joy balance out the pain? Um, yes, I think it does. I think um, in a way it helps me recognize the joy now. You know, I hid it for so long I didn't really know what joy was. I think that's the whole reason that we as gay people want to celebrate. We want to have celebrations because when you're in the closet, you never get to have a celebration. You don't celebrate birthdays or anniversaries or things like that because there's something that's always hidden. And now I can truly celebrate who I am. I was saying to my son yesterday by a point of explanation, you can't really laugh and be happy until you've cried your heart out from the pain inflicted on yourself or from the world. Right. 
I think, and that's a quote I use in my book, without, um, without sadness, happiness can't exist. No, no, and I haven't met Cinderella yet. I think she's a fable. <laughs> How long did it take you to put the book together? It took me about five years mm -hmm. uh, to put the book together. I started, I signed up for an online writing class um, on December 12th, 2012. Tw one, two, one, two, one, two. <laughs> and it's sort of the way that I moved in writing the book. Um, but before that, I had started a personal blog that was called The Authentic Life because I wanted to write stories about my life outside of the closet to show what it was like. and. One of those got picked up in the Huffington Post and then the Boston Globe, and it started, it started to roll, and I figured, oh, I can write a book. Did now. you get famous? Did I? I'm not sure. <laughs> it depends on what your definition of famous is. I prefer infamous. <laughs> <laughs> I might be infamous. <laughs> so were you and Paul married when your book came out? Yes, we were. And did yes. he appreciate it? He did. Um, we sort of have this rule. He doesn't read anything that I write until it's ready to publish. Wow. Um, and I gave him the book after my editor had gone through a couple of copyrights and developmental edits. I gave it to him. He put it on his iPad and it sat there for like a week. And I started to get angry, like, okay, Ooh. I've written this. But don't you think he might have been a trepidatious, a little bit afraid? Um, Paul's not really like that. No. He's not that type. I think he was just setting it aside for the right time. So we got on a plane, and we flew from Boston to San Francisco. I'm sitting right next to him. He pulls out the iPad. And he starts scrolling through the book. And I was like, you are not going to read this right now with me next to you. But he did. And before we landed, he got to the final page and he was swiping it like this. And it wouldn't move. And I said, that's the end. <laughs> and I said, well. And he held his finger up. And then he started crying. And so I started crying. And so... It, it was really a wonderful, magical moment. Oh, good, yeah. good. Because I would think, might have been afraid that he loves you enough that he wouldn't have wanted to correct you, but personally didn't like what you said. <laughs> <laughs> Fortunately, he liked the book. <laughs> oh, good. And it's been received well? It's been received very well. Um, the New York Times did a review on it. It was uh, a New York Times editor's choice for a book. Not bad. No, not bad at it's all. right up there with Oprah. <laughs> right. Um, and I am working on an essay for Oprah Magazine. So, Excellent. Yeah, Maybe you'll get to be well. her book. Yes. She big announced me yesterday. The minute she opens her mouth, they sell. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I'm not sure I need Oprah to tell me what to read. Although, in this situation, I read everything. I don't just read what I would choose. That's excellent. It is. Yeah, it helps you expand your oh, horizon. Oh, I learn so much. It, there isn't a book I've done that I haven't learned something from. And a lot of, especially the history, the same guys keep on showing up in Salem history, Danvers history, Boston history. I can't get over how they got around. <laughs> I mean, I allowed an hour to get here this morning, and they packed up bag, baggage, and furnishings and moved overnight and threw a party the next yeah. day. <laughs> That's fantastic. It must have been hard to have been gay in, in that time period. I don't suppose it's ever easy. Um, you're right, and it certainly has been around since the dawn of time. Mm -hmm. We just don't always hear about it. but. Um, there are more and more people writing about gay people throughout history, which is actually going to be my second book. Um, I'm working on a fictional uh, book now, but it's based on my great uncle who was a medic in World War II, and he was gay, um, and he was in the Pacific Theater. But as children, we didn't hear those stories because no. they weren't um, fit to be told. And a lot of them, if they really saw action, they did not speak of it. Right. You meet a blowhard that's telling you about machine guns and anti-war ballistic. He was in the kitchen peeling potatoes. <laughs> right. What's the next book going to be about? So the next book is about uh, my great uncle, 
um, who was a medic in World mm -hmm. War II. So he said. And he was living But he with, didn't declare. I'm sorry? Nobody knew he didn't. Uh, he actually, I've done research, he lived with a man mm -hmm. for three or four years prior to the war in several different houses. And he listed this man as his next of kin on his draft record. And my aunt, who was also a lesbian, told me that great uncle Don was gay as well. And so I'm going to explore the time period of him in the war and having to hide that secret and and try and be who he was and um, also tell the story of my summer with my aunt Sheila in 1983. So it's more of a historical fiction based on truth. You get into trouble when you start messing with family. They'll all uh, correct you. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I know. <laughs> I've written a book about that. <laughs> How did your biological family react? Um, I was terrified of how they would <laughs> react. And the thing you have to do when you write a memoir is, is pretend that nobody is going to read it as you're writing it. Because you have to get the truth down on the page. And if you begin to think that people are going to read it, then you can't do that. Um, Ann Hood, who is one of my friends, said, write the thing that you think you cannot say. And once you do, you gain power over the truth. And that is exactly what I thought as I wrote the book. But I also had to be really cognizant of why people act the way they do. Why did my mother act the way that she did? Why did my ex-wife act the way that she did? And so I really had to examine that and show that on the page because I wanted to show fully formed, well-rounded people and to also show the motivation. Nobody is a complete villain and nobody's a complete hero. Mm -hmm. It's the way that I portray myself in the book as well. Um, I sent the book to my mother a couple of days before Mother's Day. She got up on Mother's Day and started reading the book and read it until like 2 a.m. the next morning. And she sent me a text that said, I couldn't love you any more than I do right now. And it was the most cathartic mm -hmm, thing mm -hmm. that I really experienced. Did she have any inkling? Did she? The mommy she did. knows. Yeah. And what are you going to do about it? Yeah. You're, you're her kid. Right. Right. She was. She pushed me back into the closet when I was 19. But she really came to be my strongest ally. And she's probably end. afraid for you. She was afraid, and that was exactly why she did it. And it was taboo. Way. Go ahead, open your mouth, and then the world's going to take a piece out of you. Exactly. It was also in the 1980s, and the AIDS epidemic came about, and. So not only was she afraid that people were going to beat me up, but she was afraid I might die. So she was trying to protect me, and I understand that now. Um, so my family has really received the book very oh, well, great. and it's been magnificent because that doesn't happen with all memoirs. No, no, nor does it happen in all si the same situations. Right. In, in, but in writing as you did, and you did a very good job, of all the situations that you were afraid of, you have eliminated circumstances that could very well affect the next person who's sitting there wanting the same freedom but is terrified because all they've ever heard is stories of the family that abandoned you and wrote you out of the will and doesn't send you a Christmas card. And, you know, so you, you've lost your family and that was the price yeah, I could keep you in the closet for another 50 years. Right. I've had so many people write to me and say they were so afraid that they were going to end up alone and lonely later in life. And, and my reply back to them is nobody knows who you are now. So, so you are lonely already. When did you know? I knew... I knew at an early age. I knew when I was five or six. Wow. Um, but I didn't have the words to say mm -hmm. what I was. I certainly mm -hmm. wouldn't have said I'm gay. You know, that, that just wasn't a part of my vernacular. Um, and also, it was before the Internet. And so, and there were no role models. So I couldn't really... That you knew of. Yeah, that I knew <laughs> of. Um, 
And so in my head, I sort of wondered, well, I wonder if everybody sort of feels this way. And then they change as they get older uh, unless, because I couldn't talk to anybody about Right, unless it. I have a dear friend who just recently passed, and she's from Germany. She always had biological problems. She suffered terribly. So I think she was 80 years old when they found out they did an operation in Germany, very different appendectomy than we do here. And that's what screwed up her insides for the oh, wow. 70 coming years. But she didn't, you don't say, how are your bowels moving today? <laughs> you know, do, right. you, do you have pain constantly? <laughs> you just And she was such a lady that she wouldn't have even if the three people in the room said something. But if you don't have somebody to discuss it with, if you can't, and you lean heavy on trust. Right. Yeah, uh, and, and it's really hard to find somebody who you really, truly can trust these days. Right. Um, and that's why I think stories are necessary, and that's why I think books are necessary, um, and memoirs, so that you can find somebody else who, who is going through the same thing you are. And this is not just for people who are gay and in the closet, but it's also for their families and for the children and who have And for their interviewers. And for their interviewers. So that I, I'm telling you, when David invited me to, to review his book, wow, I mean, that's no small interview. Yeah. But I was afraid I'd ask the wrong question. Out of lack of education of myself, I didn't want to be insulting. I didn't want to be stupid either. Mm -hmm. And I was so grateful that you respect me enough to know I've never lived your life, but so far I don't think I've offended you. You have not. <laughs> <laughs> we got 10 minutes left. <laughs> Do you find people are offended? Has anybody approached you with negativeness? Yes, oh. yeah. Um, but not necessarily, because I'm gay. I haven't, I haven't gotten that. It's, it's interesting. Some. Some people have taken offense to the book's title, The Lie, um, and, and those are, I've heard from a few gay men who have said, I, you know, for me it wasn't a lie. It was, I, there was no other way that I could be. And, well, at the time, that's true. And exactly. And, and so the lie has multiple levels, though. The lie is not just what I told, but also what was told to me was that a gay boy could never really be loved. Um, and it also has to do with a catfishing incident where my picture was used. Oh, that, that's um, frightening. How did you find, were you looking for dates? <laughs> no. To find, how did you find yourself on a dating site? I, I don't lie. <laughs> <laughs> it's all the truth now. Um, I received an email from a woman I had never met, and she said, oh, your right. face has meant a lot to me, but now I found out it's a lie. She had a four-year online relationship with somebody who used my pictures to catfish her. So I did a reverse Google image search and found out she wasn't the only one. My picture had been used on multiple dating sites. Well, that's very flattering. Um, yeah, <laughs> but you know, it's just because it was, a, it was a picture that was taken at the right angle and the right light, and it was probably 85% me, because there were nice filters and all of that. Um, but I've had about 15 women contact me now who have said they've had relationships with men who used my picture. My picture was just, for whatever reason, it, it came from a Huffington Post article and it was married to the search phrase 40-year-old white man or 40-year-old man selfie. So men who are looking for a picture to use, type that in. So for the benefit of the it. audience like me who didn't know what catfishing was, in why you were often caution not to put our grandchildren's picture or our children's pictures up on Facebook and such without hitting those buttons that make it non-copyable. I don't post anything. <laughs> I can. Um, some literally copied your picture and used it on dating sites. Yes. Did they stop? Are you still out there? Do you know? I received an email last week from another woman who wow. had... Oh, you poor thing. <laughs> <laughs> You know, it's interesting. I when I we'll, find we'll hear this <laughs> and five more people will copy. <laughs> Probably that's why I'm trying to get the word out so it'll end. <laughs> um, but it's interesting. You know, when I finally stopped lying, my face continued to lie to women. Yeah. So it's it's karmic, karmic irony. I think that this continues. Do you to still happen. post pictures? 
<laughs> At this point, it's out there so much. <laughs> yes, I still post pictures. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, how many years were you married? I was married for 20 years wow. um, to a woman, to mm -hmm. my uh, wife. And how's that relationship now? It's actually in a really good place. Oh, good. My daughters are both in great relationships. My youngest is in med school. My ex-wife is engaged to another man. Um, and we talked on the phone a couple of months ago and she said, you know, I made a decision a long time ago not to hate you because that if that would eat her up. Yeah, the, the, I don't get that. People carry those bones in a backpack, and when they got nothing to do, they take it out and suck out the marrow <laughs> and, and feel pain and cry. And you're not doing anything to the person who inflicted exactly. the pain. Exactly, it's only hurting you. Yeah. But she also said, uh, when she gets married, she asked if my current husband and I would go to the wedding. Wow. Which I thought was incredibly yes. forgiving and powerful. And it speaks to how we want to raise our children. You know, there was love. There's always been love there. And that will never go away. And it continues. Good. Tell her I'm proud of her. I will. <laughs> you cry. You, you'd be <laughs> the first one to cry at the wedding. <laughs> I would. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. No. Steroids, which started this opening mm -hmm. and but you use them to bulk up and be more masculine yeah um, I was crumbling I was spiraling into a depression um, and throughout my life I've always sort of struggled with body image issues because I was always skinny and skinny to oh, me was always thing. weak. I know that sounds horrible <laughs> but as a young boy you don't want to be that no. skinny kid who no. you know all the other boys you know call skeleton legs or whatever and so you, you internalize that and I internalized that with my homosexuality and the two went together. So when I was crumbling on the inside, I thought I'm gonna bulk up on the outside and be that strong masculine man that I felt I should portray. But you had to hide the steroids and hide that you used them. You spent, I think you weren't in a closet, I think you were in a cave. Yes, I was in many closets. <laughs> there weren't just, there wasn't just one, no, there were many. No. Yeah. And that had to be hard to keep track of. It gets, um, when you're in the closet, you have to be super organized There's and know where everything clothes. is. No room for night. clothes. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> We're going to break for a minute and you're going to read for us so that our audience can get an idea of the sincerity, the honesty in your manner of presenting the story. Okay. okay. Thank you. Be right back. When the girls went to bed, I wandered the house taking stock of things that were no longer mine. There on the dining room table was the blue metal pitcher we found in an antique shop in New Hampshire. This painting above the brick mantle was my 20th wedding anniversary gift to her. To her. Here was the sofa where Catherine and I once lay side by side with a sleeping dog at our feet. The wooden floors creaked as I passed. When I reached the top of the stairs, Catherine stood motionless in the dark hall. Can I sleep with you? Just sleep this one last night, I asked. Don't wake me in the morning, she said. She removed her nightgown. I took off my shirt. That was her side of the bed, and this used to be mine. Here was the blue comforter where we cradled our newborn girls. These were the pillows flattened with use. I lay awake on my back. She rested her hand on my neck. I turned to my right side and she to her left as we twisted in our bittersweet ballet of goodbye. In the grainy morning light, I closed the bedroom door and tiptoed to my daughter's rooms. This was Olivia's. Those were the boxes filled with her dolls. I tucked her dark hair behind her ear and kissed her warm cheek. Here was Claire's. These were her glasses. I picked them up and cleaned them with the tail of my shirt. I'm just going to work now, I muttered, 
a half-truth in the half-light. This behind me was the house full of secrets, and here before me was the path that lay ahead. This is what I left, an empty chair at the dining room table, the scent of my skin on the bedroom sheets, an old painting, a sleeping dog, a blue pitcher, my lingering shadow on the front steps before I let go. If that didn't make you cry, <laughs> you're better than me. It makes you human. It, 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 we're the same. We really are. Yes. But so many people, and it had to be part of the upbringing because they were tough on us years ago. <laughs> yes, they mm -hmm. were. And that, as much as you want to understand, it's there. But you did a great job in knocking some bricks out of those walls. Thank, Thank you. you. And Thank you. And would you please bring back the next book and don't make us chase you because you are famous. <laughs> I would love to. <laughs> I would love to. Thank you. That's it. Well, off the shelf, books on tour. The name of the book is A Lie. Truth. Thank you.